And we are live. Welcome back. This is episode number two of the Calibrated Roundtable. We have a great roundtable for you guys today. Uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. I can see the chat starting to fill up. Uh, it's good to see everybody. And I really hope you enjoy this today because we have a very special guest, uh, the one, the only, David Sachs. Welcome, David Sachs. How are you doing today, sir? Good. Good to be with you. Yes, it is excellent to have you on. Uh, this has been sort of in the making for a little bit. So it's <laughs> nice to finally get to talk to you uh, face to face yes. or, you know, computer to computer. Um, we also have Zag. Uh, you know, you guys know Zag. He's a regular here. And uh, Clown is joining us today to talk about everything Ukraine, geopolitics, everything. Oh, and there is our other guest, Pyotr. Pyotr, how are you doing today as well, my friend? Uh, good, yeah. Um, it's been a typical cloudy day here in London, so so I'm on my phone at the moment. Uh, I'll doing? probably switch to my laptop later on during the chat, but um, yeah, interested to see what you guys are saying and have a chat about geopolitical shit. Yeah. So let's get should, to it. It should be fun. <laughs> uh, Clown, how are you doing today? I don't know if he's here. He said he was going to be back in just a second. Oh, I'm back. Okay. Good to be here. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Piotr. Nice to finally uh, meet you, uh, David. Yeah, you, you I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to lie. When I first saw you uh, gaining traction on on Twitter, I mistook you for the other David Sachs. Well, who's the other one? The Economist. He worked with uh, with Anders Oslund in uh, in Russia in the nineties. But he's S A. I thought that was Jeffrey Sachs. Pardon, Jeffrey? Oh yeah, I not good with names. It clearly. <laughs> yeah. So this is only David Sachs. You, you thought it was somebody else. I thought uh, it was Gutter Sachs. That's all good. It's all good. Um, well, yeah, Je Jeffrey Sachs would be uh, definitely a more prestigious uh, guest for you. Uh, his name is spelled differently than mine, so no, no, no. no relation. But yeah, no, Jeffrey Sachs is awesome. I don't, I, I don't know. I haven't heard of the other David Sachs. I guess there's a few people out there with. I mistook, I mistook uh, the the Economist Sachs for David on, yeah. because I'm apparently terrible with names. <laughs> it's all good. Um, no, David, we are very pleased to have you here today. Um, is there anything that is specifically on everybody's mind that they would like to talk about right now? Because something that I wanted to bring up, the first topic that I wanted to talk about is the ongoing election in Russia. The Ukrainian response to this ongoing election, the, the, the Western propaganda about the, this election, um, and it's, I guess it's overall legitimacy. I, I, I feel like this is a good topic that we can get into and we can discuss um, just to set the stage a little bit. Um, the Russian elections are currently ongoing uh, through from the 15th through the 17th. Um, at the end, the president of Russia will be uh, selected. Uh, I think we can all guess who is going to be uh, picked based off of popularity and, you know, uh, just the general situation in Russia. Ziogonov um, upset. Let's go. Yeah, I know. Wait, waiting for it. Um, but a lot of the Western uh, articles being written about the election currently uh, portray it as this uh, authoritarian, uh, you know, sort of situation where you can only vote for one person. There's armed guards at every polling station. Uh, you know, it's, un it's, it's at gunpoint is sort of the deal. Um, I'm curious as to your guys's perspectives on the current Russian election. Uh, election, uh, how you see it playing out, um, and not so much in the actual results, but in the, um, the I way think before the we West do that, it's worth keeping it. in mind a little bit about what Russia's political system actually is meant to be, or is. In theory, it's supposed to be a semi-presidential republic, so mirror that of France. Um, the president predominantly is the head of state, he does foreign affairs, and the prime minister is largely domestic and has a large proportion of what you might have as an interior minister in a you know purely presidential republic or something right um now putin is when you vote for a party you or when you vote for a person you're actually voting for a party so up until 2018 i think it was putin ran under the united russia banner which was the party that won in 2099 um and you know russia would win or united russia would win i don't know huge swathes of the electorate vote and what's known as the systemic opposition which is the communist party the ldp which is 
the name is Liberal Democratic Party, but it's not really that Liberal Democratic. That's Zirinovsky's uh, party, right? Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Zirinovsky died, I think, in 22, and Putin went to his funeral, um, despite the two being opposite party people putin respected him and 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 shows you that there's not that much difference between the parties but the point i'm making is that the systemic opposition is supposed to you know hold united russia and incumbent party to account but they largely agree with the russian president whoever it is i.e putin on most foreign issues domestic may be slightly different but foreign policy it's always in agreement um which doesn't mean you have much of an alternative perspective in parliament you do have other non-official parties that are allowed to express interest in running but it's up to the judicial system and you know electoral commission and stuff like that to allow them to run which doesn't often happen um since 2018 putin has now been a independent and has still won you know phase of the of the election and you know he wins very strongly in the rural areas the further east you go but if you're in towns like Rostov or uh, Novosibirsk or St. Petersburg or wherever it is, his leadership isn't as clear. And we've seen people coming out by, you know, diluting the boxes or making strong statements. So if you're talking about the quote unquote intelligentsia, then they tend to be more westernized or, you know, that people say they're being influenced by Western values or whatever it is. So they tend to be more opposed to Putin or just they want more choice. So that's a little bit of a backdrop. Western countries or analysts will call Russia a, you know, an authoritarian state. Others will call it a hybrid, you know, that it is a democracy, but none of the elections are fair and free. You know, it's like Turkey or Hungary or, or, or that's the kind of examples analysts, quote unquote, will call it. So I'm not trying to add my own opinion in now. I'm just trying to give some context. Oh, that's an excellent that's, rundown, yeah, Theodore. Thank so, you. Anyway, I'll shut up now. But yeah, curious to hear what you guys think. Scott, you're muted. Thank you. David, do you have an opinion on this? I, I'm curious as to your thoughts on the uh, ongoing election. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to claim to understand the inner workings of the Russian system. Um, I mean, that's that would be out of my depth. I can't really speak to whether these elections are on the level or how on the level they are. Uh, I do look at polling by groups like Levada Center, which is I think respected and and trusted in the West, and what they show is that Putin's polling numbers uh, now are around eighty percent. He's very, according to them, he's very popular in Russia. So I don't know why he would need to rig this election. It seems like uh, he was popular before the war, and he's even more popular now. Russians have not only rallied around the flag, but have essentially accepted his version of the events that led up to the war. They basically accept his narrative around the war. Um, and they, I think, have accepted that the war on some level is existential for them. And now that they're clearly winning the war, I think Putin's even more popular. So, you know, I guess the reflexive Western narrative around any Russian election would be that it's bogus and rigged and that it's, um, you know, that their system in no way resembles a democracy and all of that. Um, and I, I, I do, I think, believe that their system is more authoritarian than uh, a lot of Western systems. But at the same time, I don't believe the narrative that Putin is unpopular or the war is unpopular or that there's any risk uh, to him of a popular uprising or of a palace coup. Uh, and we heard all, remember, we heard all those narratives at the beginning of the war. Um, it was linked to sanctions that you know, the Biden would um, impose all these crushing sanctions on the Russian economy and then the people would rise up because they wouldn't put up with it. They didn't want to fight this war. And then the Russian oligarchs, seeing their riches seized, would then turn on Putin. Any event, there's all this giddy talk at the beginning of the war about how our policy would lead to Putin's overthrow. And um, and of course, you don't hear that kind of talk anymore. So, um, so yeah, I mean, look, I'm kind of getting far afield from the topic of the the elections but do i believe that putin is at any risk of being toppled no do i believe that's just because putin has a sort of authoritarian grasp on power no i actually think that his policy based on everything we know is popular in russia yeah i, t I tend to agree um i mean i do agree uh obviously we I, i'm always very careful with the the polling 
just because you, you just never know. But it, it, the, the, the poll that you did mention is a it is an independent poll, right? I'm, I'm correct in saying that it's not. Yeah. Levada centers a it's a good it's a yeah. slightly less. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good source uh, that David's chosen. It's a, it's a decent source. Yeah. Levada. So so I mean, it, it, it reflects what I would consider the reality of the situation. And it really points to this very strange sort of um, what I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about the recent Belgorod and Kursk uh, incursions by the Ukrainian uh, armed forces. Um, it it really is quite odd that that is the position that the Ukrainians are choosing to take right now in terms of interfering with this election. Um, the fact that it's failing, I think, is even worse. It, it kind of um, reaffirms what Putin has said about being under attack. It reaffirms his strength in the fact that these attacks are failing at the end that the election is going ahead uh, without much upset, considering the uh, geopolitical situation that Russia is in, having a war on its border, uh, a large war in Europe on its border. Um, do you guys see I, I'm trying to make sense of the Ukrainian plan here. Is this just complete desperation or is there something a little bit more? Uh, impactful here? Are they are they just trying to cause chaos, or is there some sort of goal in mind? Uh, it's 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 hard to say because I don't understand. Um, I get I get what they're what they're trying to accomplish. You know, uh, undermine the elections. Oh look, P Putin leaves you unsafe. You're being attacked. But at the same time, who actually thinks that way? Uh, more likely, it's completely backfiring and strengthening the resolve of the Russian people because they're being attacked, allegedly. I say allegedly because it was a clown show, and I don't even... Uh, there was footage from Kharkov uh, last year like being presented as happening in Belgorod. That, I believe, was Jason J. Smart uh, push -up pushing that one. Also, uh, footage from... The, from uh, Kazakhstan three years ago being pushed as oh look at what's happening in Belgorod, but no it's it's just going to um, tighten resolve and uh, trigger a rally behind the uh, rally around the flag effect around our wartime leader, just like uh, we're seeing in uh, let's say uh, another ongoing conflict in 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 Israel, uh, and this is the opposite situation because Netanyahu was not very popular going into the conflict. But there's a rally around the flag effect where even the people who hate him are rallying around him because they're under attack. That's how this normally works. Nobody, this is World War II mentality where, like, if we strategic bomb the citizens enough, they'll, like, rise up and overthrow a government. And historically, that does not happen. Especially if, if, if it's Russians doing it, because that's the way it's been portrayed in Western media, that these are Russians harbored by Ukraine who are loyal to um, the anti-tyrannical version of Russia and that they are launching attacks against Putin and that there are many other people who feel similar to them. That's, that's another portrayal, which is also inaccurate. And, um, I, I don't think honestly, it's inaccurate. I, I think there are groups of people in any country that are anti the incumbent. Right, but, but, but to, to the extent that they're funded and armed, um, versus the way they've been portrayed um, in the last week, they're, they're, they're very well armed and they're a tag bunch. I think they're part of a, of a AFU brigade of some sort. And I think this was always planned for the election time. Um, this is what they were going to do. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to Russian go back process. quickly to the, to the stats quickly, because that's also important, a bit of context for that. So, you know, most... The, I don't know, strong men, I'm just going to pretend that we'll, we'll let, let's just say that Putin's a dictator, right? Let's just go along with this narrative for a minute. I know people aren't going to agree with it, but I'm just trying to use it as an illustration, right? But basically, when you're talking about people who aren't necessarily voted in on a regular basis, someone who's been in power for an extended period of time, like Putin, um, their numbers are very important. Because if you have a, a, a popularity of anything less than like 60 50 percent that's a lot different to than if you're all sort of in the uk or america right um because you're not at risk of being voted in and out as often so 
your entire power structure and foundation of people, the keys that keep you in power, the people that you have to keep happy, if they're not happy, then you begin to get more and more uh, worried and your your foundations are unstable. It doesn't matter if a democratic leader in the UK is heinously unpopular. It's sort of, you know, we sort of assume that comes with the, 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 the democratic cycle, right? Um, but with Putin, the reason I'm saying this is, is David was right in that his average popularity around now is like 80 percent. And that's his lowest was in 2012 when you had what the West called the snow revolution, which is their term of like, you know, color revolutions, orange revolution, that sort of thing. And basically that came after Putin extended his term when Medvedev was in power. Uh, Putin, as prime minister, basically made his power. He, he he was able to run as many times as he wanted, and there was weren't many Russians in the in the educated urban centres. That's the key point. Um, who weren't happy about that? So the the Westernised Russians, the ones that were more internationalised, weren't happy with that, and they went out in massive protests. And Putin's uh, popularity plummeted to about fifty five percent. Ever since though, Crimea and the whole situation with Eastern Ukraine and and, and so on. Putin's popularity has been in the high 60s, 70s. And after the sanctions by the West and the whole, you know, war of words and information war, um, Putin's really doing like he's popular. So it, it's not really a case of if he wins, it's just by how much more than already. And ultimately, he gets to make the policies that he wants. Um, and that's why some people think that Putin, whilst he, I think there's a nuance there, I guess, David, was what I'm saying between whether or not he's fully popular, but what he, whether or not what he's doing is still liked by, you know, every Russian, right? Um, I think there's a difference there and, and, and we should keep that in mind. And then to Zag's point about Belgorod, and then I'll shut up. I, I've i looked into this group. They're a ragtag bunch. Um, they're ultra nationalists from what I understand. They're definitely not reflective, I think, of broader Russian sentiments. And we saw the successes that they had in entering Belgorod. Um, and, um, and, and, and I think what Ukrainian, um, uh, you know, propagandists, whatever, people on both sides are propagandists. Um, what people on the Ukrainian side try to do is they take that white, blue Russian flag that you've seen, which has been used by Russians who are anti-Putin as a sort of symbol of peace or democracy. And they've tried to use it as a way to say, no, these Russians, are, you know, they're, they're pro-Ukraine, they're anti-Putin. And it's like, actually, if you look at the people who are fighting, they wouldn't use that flag. And I don't think I did see any of them using the flag. I mean, is that right, Scott? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, um, well, the, the the Free Russian Legion and the other group that's associated, first off, just for everybody listening, they number no more than 100 people. So they are fully supported by the AFU. They do not have heavy armor. They do not have artillery. They do not have all of this other stuff. So these this is a AFU, basically a group of mercenaries fighting with the AFU, and they're identity is this Russian legion, right? Um, it's a great propaganda tool. It's a great way to excuse uh, attacks on Russia proper, but everybody knows that it's the AFU. It's AFU planning that attacks come from Ukrainian territory. So it's directly AFU supported. logistics, AFU, yeah, AFU logistics yeah. and everything. So that it's not really a Russian invasion of Russia. It's a Ukrainian attempt to uh, disrupt elections or whatever on the border. Um, and it has failed miserably. And and what I believe has come out of this is that Putin is now going to be even stronger after these elections. And to me, the whole goal of this Ukraine project, this is my personal opinion and bias on it, is that the goal was regime change in Russia. And that is now become that is now looking like a pipe dream for Europe and the United States. I, I don't see how that occurs. Um, and, and I'm curious as to what you guys think for the future of this Ukraine project. I mean, we already have uh, reports coming out from Israel. Um, I posted about it yesterday. Uh, David, I believe you posted about it as well, uh, that the Israelis are out of uh, 155 millimeter artillery shells. Their supplies are incredibly low. Uh, they need more support from the United States in that department. And if you know anything about what's going on in Ukraine right now, Ukraine is having a severe artillery shortage. Um, I believe that Israel is more important to the United States than Ukraine is in terms of our geostrategic interests and the uh, amount of lobbying that is done in the United States for each of those places. Um, so I believe those shells will end up going to Israel over um, Ukraine. And, and I'm curious as to what you guys see 
as the next steps for Europe, the next steps for the United States? Are, do you think the United States is going to be looking for an off ramp here? Do, I, it doesn't appear that Europe is looking for an off ramp as they are trying to get some sort of coalition together. Uh, David, I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts yeah. on both Europe and the United States. Well, I, I retweeted that that tweet. I guess it was an Israeli official who said that they're running low on uh, one one five five millimeter artillery shells and then also tank shells. I, you know, that that's, that hasn't really been confirmed by let's call it a mainstream media source yet, and it certainly hasn't percolated through the consciousness of policymakers. But assuming that report is true, I think it's hugely significant. Because it was already the case that the Ukrainians were suffering from, I guess, shell hunger. It's like the latest media term for the fact they don't have enough artillery shells. But now they're going to be competing for shells with Israel. And every single shell that we give Ukraine is one less shell going to Israel. Now, neocons and kind of our Washington, the blob in general, will never acknowledge that American power has limits. And therefore, we tra we face trade-offs. And we should have to prioritize. I mean, our whole foreign policy is based on apparently not making any trade-offs or prioritization decisions. We try to do everything at once. But I think that if it's true that Israel now is out of artillery shells or getting low, it's simply the case that, you know, that policymakers are going to have to choose who gets shells and other weapons and ammunition. And I, I agree with you that I think for most politicians in Washington, they would say that Israel is a higher priority than Ukraine. And so I think, you know, this is going to probably take a few months to play out, but I think this is hugely significant. Uh, and just, just to add on to what you just said, I don't know if you heard um, the, uh, um, sorry, the house leader um, get up and talk about uh, the situation in the world yesterday. Um, I can play it in just a second, actually. I, I think I will play it. Um, uh, yeah, let me actually go is, over. And is that the it. one where he uh, left out Ukraine? Yes. I think that's partly because they're trying to separate out the bills. Oh, yeah. They're, I, I they're, they're not going to They're not going to pass together it's at all. Still, it's still not a good sign for Ukraine, though. So here, let me just take so everybody knows what I'm talking about here. Uh, right here. And we'll play this. Um in many ways, our hearts are heavy in spite of the of the, uh, the fun fellowship because stability is being threatened in Europe and in the Middle East, and our allies and friends such as Israel and Taiwan continue to fight for their very right to exist. Um, so in that's just a little snippet. Um, mm -hmm. He goes on to talk about some other stuff there. Um, but I, I think that's particularly interesting because he does mention security in Europe. He does make mention of it. But when it comes to who are our allies, he specifically – omits Ukraine and brings up Taiwan and Israel, which definitely seems like the direction that U.S. foreign policy is headed away from Ukraine towards the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Do you guys uh, sort of agree with that? Yes, um, I think it's become clear over the last uh, several weeks, especially with a lot of Macron statements, Germany trying to get brought in, into the fold here with rearming Ukraine with missiles, Poland. I think Europe is going to have to assume responsibility for Ukraine militarily. I think that's the shifting trend in the United States will cover Israel and Taiwan, because, as David said, uh, the, you know, currently the U.S. cannot cover everyone uh, if they do not militarize the economy, which they won't. And uh, it's it's becoming clear that Europe's going to have to pick up the slack with Ukraine. And, and, and Rheinmetall has 35 billion in outstanding orders much of that in artillery ammunition. So they're going to have to pick it up if, if Ukraine wants a chance here. That's my thought. There's yeah, a... I would I would just piggyback off that. that um, uh, personally, for me, that Biden is a, a back against a bit of a wall. I did see a poll from Reuters earlier saying that his popularity or the likelihood of who, you know, uh, you know, exit poll or whatever it is, poll, um, you know, he was at 50 percent, Trump's at 48. So we are talking neck and neck. But there's never been, from what I can remember, a incumbent U.S. president with, you know, presence and war in the Middle East that's exactly done well. So there is that. And I and I personally think that ultimately, um, despite what Biden says about his opinions to do with Netanyahu, he doesn't like Netanyahu. Um, I think they still value Israel more than Ukraine. 
ultimately for strategical interests in in the Middle East versus also because we're talking about the Gulf of Aden. The Financial Times released a really quite incredible, I thought it didn't get much attention, but about the secret talks the US and Iranians have been having since January about the Houthi and Gulf of Aden shipping attacks, which shows you where America's interests are. It's about international trade and they don't want to obviously see their economic interests gone. So for me, I do think that they will, uh, Ukraine will come at expense of that. And also more specifically to what Zag's point, you've got Europe who's not stepping up on NATO defence funding. Um, you've got Macron who likes to be Macron and put himself in the limelight and, you know, he wants to be seen as the guy who's leading Europe's redefined strategical vision and shit like that. So I definitely think that if Europe is going to continue to do this sort of stuff, it's going to piss off the, to call David's term, the blob. Um, and then, you know, America may well focus ultimately because Russia's a, um, in America's perspective, it's a reckless, disruptive power, but the systemic threat is China. That's how America sees it. And, and so ultimately, ultimately focuses on Taiwan and China because, you know, Russia can do what it wants, but America's focused elsewhere and it will be come down to the Europeans to deal with it. And I think that you're seeing that play out right now. But yeah, yeah there's a there's a few ways to, to look at this because um, the U.S. is working on uh, a significant ramp up on artillery shell production. The problem is it takes 18 to 36 months to get there. And that is uh, if it was Europe, that would be hopelessly un ambitious. But the United States can pull it off in that time frame. The problem is the Ukraine war probably isn't going to last another 36 months. So, But also, the U.S. has to pivot to China eventually because that's the actual peer competitor. Not Russia is not a peer competitor to the United States. It just isn't. It hasn't been since the Cold War. That's not going to change anytime soon anyway. But they are doing a ramp up. So... That's the thing. In, in, in a short term, if it comes down to uh, Israel or Ukraine, Israel wins that 11 out of 10 times. It's it's not it's it's not even a competition. It's 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 it's, it's a given, but it's going to depend on how much longer the war in Gaza keeps going. If it ends quickly, then, yeah, it'll just um, they'll just redirect uh, munitions back uh, back towards Ukraine. Uh, as for Europe, they're in an interesting state like uh, if you guys read what I uh, read my writings, you know that I'm a big proponent of Europe getting its act together and, you know, overcoming its compulsion to uh, undermine its own defense industry at every single possible opportunity. The fact that uh, the Czechs had to go around and do the equivalent of sifting through their friends' couch pillows to find munitions and at those exorbitant prices of like four times what a, a base standard 155 mil shell should cost still cost half what it does to produce domestically. It's, uh, it's, it's obscene. Eventually you're going to run out of, uh, supply of, of surplus on the open market. Uh, prices are going to be driven up the more they, the more they, um, the more they do that. It's not going to take them anywhere, anywhere near as uh, 36 months to, to do the ramp up. Although they are trying, uh, it's going to take them far longer. It's, um, it's not a bad time. It's a, sorry. It's not a good time to be Ukraine if you're looking for uh, for uh, for artillery shells. A million or sorry, eight hundred thousand are being sent, but that's uh, what in the first year of the war they were firing twenty thousand a day. That's like what forty days of shells. Yeah. Yeah, you have the uh, yeah the Czechs are scouring the Peloponnese right now, and and I'm sure the Greeks are going to get some sort of uh, kickback on their debt if they um, hand off some of these shells, some of these old pieces of equipment, they're probably going to get a write-off. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's very funny. The problem with the Greeks, though, is they can't send too much over because that's what are, you see them sending uh, World War II vintage uh, equipment now. It's because, you know, everybody likes to think that NATO, uh, that, you know, because they're both in NATO, Greece and Turkey will never come to blows. But if you know Greek history, you know Turkish history, you know mm -hmm recent history between the two that's a millennia old blood feud that is that is always a chance oh, yeah. to come to blows they can't uh, neither can afford to disarm sufficiently to give the other an advantage and 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 von you made me think of another thing which i, I don't know if you you've seen this david but um the uh the, the polls when when they met uh was it yesterday or whenever it was thursday you know, this is a re, uh, a re ignition or revitalization of um, what's known as the Weimar Triangle, which is a regional alliance of France, Germany, and Poland. Uh, it was created in ninety one um, after Poland gained its independence. Um, but what's interesting is that 
this has really become a, a sort of a growing thing since uh, Tusk, the you know leader of Poland, took over. He's much more pro EU. He's much more anti Russia. He's 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 much less like the piss party was. Um, and what you're seeing, uh, in my opinion, is a pivot away from the Visegrad group, which was the you know with the Slovakia and and um, Czech Republic and and Hungary towards the other two because you've got. Um, task which is much more pro-european but you've also had the more pro-russia slovakia election um or a person who won the election and obviously hungary who's a, a big supporter of, of putin um and and someone that the the europeans the west doesn't really get on with at the moment so i think you're seeing this sort of reallocation of focus for one of the main actors in eastern europe um and one obviously the most vocal as a critic of russia um, and I, and I think that, along with Macron and everything, you you are going to see a, a growth in a European dipl diplomatic activities, and whether or not that plays into America. I think some of this is also as a precursor in case for again the Ameri the Europeans see Trump as a threat, so they're trying to you know put be proactive before Trump comes in and then you know reduces or removes all funding U.S. funding to NATO. So I, there's definitely a lot of uh, developments at play right now. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> one of the things that I'm I'm curious about though, and, and Clown brought this up, is the the time that it takes. Is, is Europe doing all of this too little, too late? I mean, it, 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 if if you ask me, they should have done this the second Russia invaded Ukraine. Obviously, that doesn't work with European economies. That doesn't work with like the global economy. Uh, it's really hard to put yourself onto a war footing and start investing a bunch into your military industrial complex, but. At this point, without the hindsight that we have now, it really does appear that this is a, just a desperate move from Schultz, uh, Macron and Tusk, who are going to be on the receiving end of a Ukrainian loss. I think this is what a lot of people thought was going to happen the entire time. You know, the U.S. kind of started it, really pushed it, supported it heavily. But at a certain point, just that's it, U.S. politics these things just become unimportant, right? The second they're not making money, the second they become more uh, of a burden to election campaigns, to, you know, whatever, uh, as soon as the image is gone, the U.S. support drops, right? And that's what we're seeing right now. And I, my question is, is it too late for Europe? Has Europe crossed that line and now they're just in a desperate desperation mode where they're just trying to get make something out of nothing? Too late to help Ukraine? Probably. But too late for this, yes, but it's something they should have done decades ago. They didn't need Ukraine to uh, to, to you know take their uh, take their uh, defense industry, industry seriously. It's there's a few schools of thought to this. I see a lot of people talking about how you know they should go back to where they should have never come down from Cold War spending. I think that's ridiculous. But they shouldn't have scrapped their militaries, their militaries, and especially their defense production as much as they have. Uh, the problem with Europe is they don't standardize around their own equipment. So there's no demand for their producers to actually achieve economies of scale and make themselves competitive. So if it's cheaper to buy American armor, you're going to buy American armor instead of European armor, even if you're European. It's just, especially if you're not France or Germany, who's building uh, or Italy who are building them. Yeah. Look at Poland. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, that, that's a problem. Like uh, it's this, they're not going to get, uh, get to where they want to be on time for Ukraine and they're not, quite shifting to a war economy or shifting to a war to a war footing if you're looking at relative to where they were before the war but they're actually just shifting to where they should have been all along yeah i mean germany and italy especially are are going to have shortfalls uh in their budgets for defense despite increases in spending over the next five years so uh, it's a real problem for them and and I think especially a country like Italy with a strong manufacturing capacity, they really need to transition if they're serious about security. But I, I, I still assume that they're not. And a lot of these countries aren't. And I, I mean, maybe they know something we don't, but um, either the Russians aren't as serious of a threat to them or they're completely unprepared. So I, I, I'm, 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 I'm more of a, of the impression that Russia is not that serious of a threat to them. If, if you want to get down to it, uh, part of the problem is, and this is what especially irks the Americans, I think, is that the, uh, the underlying assumption of European defense is that 
the Americans will ride to the rescue regardless. So they don't need to put up the uh, to, 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 to take their defense their defense seriously. If you're Germany, well, you're not a frontline country like you were in a Cold War. You have buffers in Poland and Bulgaria and Romania. And by the time anyone gets through them, the Americans arrive. So that's and that's a huge point of contention because Americans, uh, f- I, uh, from what I could see, again, I have to clarify, I'm not American. I don't speak to I don't speak for Americans. I'm just an outside observer. Uh, feel like they're carrying the brunt of the responsibility to def- uh, to uh, you know secure Europe, and the Europeans in turn feel that. I mean, if you're going to have your uh, your military presence and political presence in Europe, the cost is you're handling security for us. When I say us, I'm not European either, but. Anyway, yeah, I would just add that I think that the um, I don't know. I mean, I I made a video on it myself earlier in the week. Look, I, I think that whilst the collective unity of NATO vis-a-vis Russia is there, in terms of you know what is the end goal? They want Russia not to be interfering in European affairs or to feel threatened by Russia or to protect countries that feel more threatened. I think that there's a uh, uh, that there's variances by which they want to go about achieving that, and that includes whether or not they want to fully fund Ukraine. So you know Scott's talked about this on his show plenty of times, but you know there's inconsistencies amongst countries that are like, yes, we're going to fully support Ukraine no matter what. The Baltics, the UK, much more hawkish countries. But then you've got other countries which, you know, the Italians, six months or even three months after the sanctions were first being imposed, what did they get? They asked for a clause so that they could still continue to send high valuable, you know, fashionable items to the Russians because the Russian market is one of their best for Gucci and Prada and blah, 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 blah. So the Italians are already undermining this, you know, full fledged support. And and that's the same with plenty of other um you know, uh, continental states. There are several other states across Europe which are like, well, you know, it's not as much of our problem and therefore, you know, we've tried to sanction, but ultimately it's not working. Maybe we should just sort of accept that, you know, Ukraine has to negotiate sort of thing. So I, I, I think the Europeans are definitely going to be securitizing, but doesn't mean every country is. And, and it doesn't mean that every country is going to agree with the bigger powers. You know, you, you've got smaller countries that are going up against the French and the whoever being like, well, we don't necessarily agree. So uh, I think Europe's got to, you know, figure out its its approach. And, and ultimately, you know, um, if it doesn't, then that's going to benefit uh, the Russians who, you know, can t- take advantage of that. And the Ukrainians will be the ones who suffer most of all because they're on the front lines doing the defending, as, 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 as you know, the Western media likes to put it. Look, I, I think that European policy is completely incoherent. Uh, on the one hand, they're talking a really big game. You've got Macron saying that they should send in troops, that this is existential for the French people. You know, how? Not really explained. You've got that. I just saw the Latvian president. Uh, he was, I mean, this was a really crazy tweet where he not only said that, uh, uh, Russia needs to be defeated. He said that he started quoting Cato the Elder, uh, saying, you know, uh, Cato the Elder said, uh, well, he said, Russia delecta est, or something like that, where it's a quote going all the way back to the Punic Wars, where uh, Cato ended his speeches uh, in the Roman Senate saying that Carthage must be destroyed. Every single talk. And, they, and the Romans finally did that. They, um, you know, Carthage was their number one enemy, and they finally did destroy Carthage, and they basically sowed the ground with salt so it could never come back. I mean, not just defeat, a total destruction. You've got this Latvian president invoking that those words, saying that Russia must be destroyed in the manner of Carthage. So these guys are talking a really big game. I mean, they're writing checks that they clearly can't cash, and the question, and I think you're right, they expect the Americans to come in and back them up. So they think that they can talk this big game and somehow America is going to come in and save them. But of course, we've got lots of other priorities and Ukraine has never been existential for us. It's a fully optional sort of um, uh, endeavor. And I think part of it was uh, I think part of it was driven by this hope of regime change. Part of it was um, driven by this idea that we could weaken Russia on the cheap because it was the Ukrainians who do the fighting and dying for us. So why not take the opportunity? to use them as a proxy to weaken Russia. Of course, that completely backfired. It hasn't made Russia weaker. It's made them stronger. Uh, and then, of course, you have the whole issue of NATO expansion that um, 
the Biden administration and the blob in general are just fanatically devoted to this idea that we're going to keep expanding NATO. So they didn't want to take that off the table. Um, so that's kind of why we're in this Ukraine war. But it's never Ukraine's never been uh, a vital interest of the United States. And as we were talking about before, if you were to ask any policymaker in Washington to stack rank uh, Ukraine, uh, Israel, or Taiwan, uh, I think for 99% of the people, Ukraine's going to come out number three. three. Um, so, uh, so yeah, but, but, but so, so I guess my point is just, it's, it's never been as, um, as important to the United States as, as these European leaders are making it out to be. Uh, but the Europeans do not have the ability. So we're talking about their industrial base. It's even more pathetic than the United States. Uh, their armed forces are in a state of total disrepair. Stephen Bryan is a former, uh, undersecretary of defense had a really good, uh, post on this already three or four months ago, talking about what an, a mess NATO was. I don't know if we can show that, but anyway, he pointed out that they've missed all of their enlistment goals for their militaries, Britain, France, Germany, their, no, their own people don't want to serve in their militaries. Uh, then you've got the fact that there was another article recently that they had this goal of producing a million artillery shells to give to Ukraine. I think they only hit 30% of the target. They hit like 300,000. And then you had uh, more recently, you had Stoltenberg do this big press conference where with great fanfare, they signed this deal to, uh, to, to uh, buy 220,000 uh, rounds of artillery ammunition, 220,000 at a cost of 1.2 billion. But the order wasn't even gonna be delivered till the end of 2025. This is a call of Reuters. So that just tells you how pathetic th their ability to deliver is. I mean, 220,000 rounds is, um, I mean, the Russians are using more than that in a single month in Ukraine. I mean, the Russians are using about 10,000 a day and the Ukrainians are barely able to keep up with 2,000 a day. Um, so, and, and the fact that Stoltenberg was holding a press conference over that, like it was some great achievement. I mean, it only flagged their weakness. Yeah. And that's, it's like a continued trend. Every time a European leader gets up, they say, they, they seem to say three or four contradictory statements that only makes them appear weaker at the end of the day. Um, when you're talking about like Macron's recent speech, he obviously he's talking about how Ukraine is existential to France. You know, if France, if France is going to have security issues in Europe, if Ukraine loses this, that, and the other, and then doesn't do anything on the back of those statements. If, if you truly believe that Russia is going to invade Poland and that, you know, there's a nuclear war on the horizon, if you don't do something and then you don't do anything, what, what, I mean, what does that say? That's so, Coming out of this whole speech that we heard, obviously French troops are not going to be sent. The French MOD has already said that, uh, this, that, and the other. It really just appears like desperation and weakness. Like they're, they, they are just scraping and trying to find something to present uh, in a way that creates or you know maintains this illusion of the Russian boogeyman coming for Europe. Um, and while at the same time not really ever committing anything and maintaining your strategic ambiguity on the whole situation. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I, it would not, if that was my leadership, it would not instill confidence in me to say the least. That's, that's all I really have to say about that. Um, I heard you guys talking about the, the differences between the European states um, in, in terms of securitizing and, and other things. Do we think that there is a bright future for the EU or, or, or is the EU on a, on a downward trend that the organization, the EU, not Europe downward, downward. That's, that's the a debt. tough one because it the can debt. survive. Yeah. But... The debt's getting outrageous to the GDP ratio for a lot of these big players, Germany, France, Italy, it's, it's creeping up. It's going to become unsustainable to finance, even like a new member, like Ukraine long-term without hemorrhaging um, or skimming from the top. Um, I think they're in for some more trouble. I mean, it's just, it's just not looking good, but um, if they can start to get maybe some cheaper Turkish manufacturing imported in there, but they're having some problems with um, allowing that 
Uh, so I don't know what, what the future is for Europe, but I think it's as far as spending on defense, I think it's fairly bleak. So and, and whoever said that is right about Macron. He could easily have made an announcement. France is, is adding X, Y, Z to an immediate aid package militarily for Ukraine. They didn't do any of that. So I, I think it was just all lip service. It's, it's also very interesting hearing them talk about the, you know, the sending more uh, long range missile systems to Ukraine. Of all the things that do not benefit Ukraine, like 50 Taurus missiles is that like, it's, it's very interesting that everybody's so hyper-focused on obviously the Wunder weapons, but um, the fact that the 50 Taurus missiles are going to make some difference and that, you know, multiple countries in Europe are trying to wheel and deal, particularly Britain and France are trying to figure out a way to get these missiles to Ukraine because they can't send any more storm shadows or scalps. Um, they, I mean, it's, it's this, it's like, there is no leadership. There's no plan. There's no priorities. It's, it's everybody's working for themselves. And it, and it, that makes, gives me the impression that the European union is going to have some very difficult uh, times ahead in terms of interrelationships, not so much outward uh, or, you know, outside forces acting upon the EU, but the EU struggling within itself. I think that's okay. fair. The, uh, uh, may, may I pull it quick, uh, quickly? Yeah, go ahead. I think the EU worked a lot better when it was, what is structures, I mean, when it was the European community earlier on before it became the Union. Now it's, you have so, you have so many states, there's a huge divide between Eastern Europe, Central Europe, and Western Europe. Uh, once you cross the Curzon line, you are in a complete, not even the Curzon line, once you cross Germany, you're in a completely different world. And that's going to be a problem. We're seeing uh, Hungary undermining uh, the EU structures by itself and the EU having no mechanism to deal with it, uh, pondering the undermining itself to uh, to bring Hungary into line. That's going to be a problem uh, with Germany deindustrializing. Potentially, that's also a huge problem. That's the engine that that's a motor that powers the, uh, the, the European Union. It always has been. So. Uh, I'm not hopeful. I don't think it's going to collapse. I think uh, the the talk of the EU disintegrating are uh, vastly exaggerated and probably a lot of wishful thinking. But I don't think it's going to be uh, it's going to be a good picture, uh, short term to midterm. Yeah, I I agree, Piotr. Yeah, I um I was looking for the times when we start disagreeing, guys. The EU is not going to collapse. Like mm -mm. you're getting you you're getting um. I, I, I don't think anybody here thinks. No, it's not going to collapse, but it's not going to be able to fund another large proxy war. With yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a much weakened and state. Be specific guys, you you literally said Zag that the EU is not going to last much longer, which is complete. No, of no, crap. I said it's it's not looking good. They have serious long term. So, what what debt serious long term? That's just not. I mean, what? you're going to have to start printing more money or or dramatically cutting uh, entitlement programs. Please illustrate the, to me which other region of the world is facing those issues as much as any, everyone is facing those issues. Yeah, but the EU has the most debt, more than the United States collectively. It's, um, it, it's especially uh, to the GDP ratio, that is. They're, they're going to have to What do you mean by that? What do you mean by the and GDP they've been, ratio? Don't they've been doing right. it with defense, Pure. They've been cutting defense for decades. Okay, so you're talking about in one specific area, but that doesn't mean the collapse of a supranational body. No, they're not going to collapse, but things are going to be economically bleak for them if they're unable to stimulate growth, and they're already not doing that. And many of their major industries have left, uh, predominantly for the United States. Just look at Germany. What well, happened then? No, that's not, no, that's not true. What are you talking yeah, I mean, about? Well, there's been capital the, flight to the U.S.? What, there's what been a lot of capital flight from Germany to the U.S., a lot. In what industry? Because it's cheaper because it, chemicals. What, in, in manufacturing, in, 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 in automotive design. Are you serious? A major serious? move. A major move. On, I mean, it's, it's, it's sorry, buddy, I'm not, I'm not going to. You're getting a bit ridiculous now. Um, the EU has its problems, but if you want to be specific, then sure. Can the EU fund another proxy war? No, of course they can't, and they're, and they're not going to. But we've already seen how the EU responds to crises, such as the um, fiscal crisis of 2012, 10 to 12. They managed to get that under control. This, But to your point, does the EU not look risky and vulnerable? Yes, of course it does. But why I'm disagreeing with you is actually because I 
and it's weird phrasing, but I actually agree with you in the sense of the EU will be more stable if it doesn't bring in the Ukrainians. The, I, I'm not against Ukraine's membership in the long term, hypothetically, but I've always been and I get a lot of pushback against this from, you know, pro Ukrainians because they suddenly think I'm being a Russian shill, which is that I don't want the Ukrainians in EU and I don't want them in NATO. NATO for provocation. EU because of economic security and stability for the for the for the project. The Ukrainians average income is three and a half thousand a year um, versus I think the poorest right now is Romania or something. Right. And even that's a little bit more. Right. It's so and the levels of corruption vis-a-vis -vis, uh, European is 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 absolutely astronomical. So I 100 percent agree with you on that. But I, I do push back strongly that somehow the EU is going to collapse. The, the growth might not be great, but stagnation doesn't necessarily mean failure. Um, so I, I personally disagree there. Um, I also don't think it's particularly worth trying to talk about that because it's so far off in the future that it's not. I think we're better off focusing on whether or not Ukraine will receive the support. And if it doesn't, what happens to Ukraine? And then is there a knock on effect for the Europeans? The last point I'd make very quickly is that you've got von der Leyen and other countries in the EU that support the idea of creating a defence commissioner. So, like, you've got the foreign commissioner, you've got the energy commissioner. Von der Leyen is trying to win her second term, so she's pushing this idea of a defence secretary, basically, for the EU. Uh, Piotr, is that related to the uh, European Army Initiative? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so. So for contact people, Macron and others have been pushing for years for a European army, which would be sort of different to NATO. But then people are like, well, then what's the point in keeping NATO? So the Americans are very against the European army because ultimately it means they don't have as much influence in Europe. But Europe wants to be more independent. So um, it depends, really. Um, is the European project going to fail because it doesn't have enough money? Possibly. But in terms of countries and what they want to do with that there are more ideas that are developing about what the eu can do so personally that's why i disagree with you Zach, because i i, I don't think the sentiment is there to let it die i think the more people want to make it work because of protection and because of over reliance on america and so on but uh, yeah adam you can see in this foreign policy article that the, the there's not a tremendous amount of enthusiasm to uh, to bring Ukraine into the EU, despite what a lot of the politicians are saying publicly. And there's two big reasons for this. One is countries like Poland don't want their farmers to have to compete with cheap grain from Ukraine. So there's a lot of economic reasons why there's, there's internal constituencies in a number of these European countries who don't want to let in Ukraine. And then the other is transfer payments. Ukraine is so impoverished, especially after this war, that a lot of countries in Europe that are net recipients of transfer payments, like Poland, would be on the other side of it. They would actually have to be contributing to countries, uh, to, to Ukraine. And so, you know, even, even something as, um, even a promise that was made to Ukraine that was, I, I guess, um, as simple as admitting them to the EU has turned out to be much more complex. And I think there's a lot less interest in doing that, again, despite what a lot of the politicians are saying. Um, just in general, you know, a frame on this war is that it's backfired in, in every possible way. And every, you know, every claim that um, the Biden administration made has come true in reverse. So, you know, we talked about how, uh, you know, the, the Biden administration said that it would crush the Russian economy. In fact, it's crushed the European economies, especially Germany. We said that we would weaken the Russian military. In fact, we've weakened ourselves by depleting our stockpiles and laying bare our, uh, that how pathetic our defense industrial base is. And I think even a, a promise that, like that we would admit Ukraine into the EU mm -hmm. and eventually into NATO, I think we've proven that that's actually never going to happen um, or it's less likely to happen now. Um, so, yeah, I just think uh, just anything we've claimed would happen because of this war, it's come true in reverse. That's kind of my overall take on the whole war. Yeah, Biden said that the uh, ruble was at, what, 200 when he was in Poland two years ago. So that's that's where his, that's I'm, I'm sure that's where their thinking was. They, they thought that those sanctions were going to do a lot more than they ended up doing. There, there was a brief, there was a brief spike in uh, the ruble, but it settled down pretty quickly. 
And I think in 2022, the Russian economy was off a couple of percent, but the dislocation was very short lived. And by 2023, the Russian economy was not only growing, was growing faster than any G7 country, including the United States. This is according to, I think, the IMF. And the projection for 2024 was similar. So the U.S. is doing well. The European economies are really struggling, Germany being the, the biggest example, because they've lost access to cheap Russian gas, which is the foundation of their industrial exports. So the EU is a total mess, I think, in every way. I mean, economically, it's suffering. Militarily, I think it's realizing that it can't solely depend on the U.S. anymore. The U.S. has other obligations. And what's in the U.S. interest is to pivot to Asia because China is our chief um, you know, rival. Our, it's, the, it's the pure competitor of the United States. And, and I think there's a growing realization in Washington that we should be pivoting to, to Asia. And of course, we already have our hands full in the Middle East. So I think Europe is sort of in a state of panic right now. They're panicking over the fact that they went whole hog in on this war uh and that you know ukraine's losing it's gonna lose um they're realizing that u.s protection may not be um you know everything that it was made out to be and their economies are also stagnant or declining so it's just i think it's just a mess for for europe yeah i i largely agree with uh david on that point i think that europe is scrambling i don't think it's complete like you know chicken headless chicken sort of thing but there is definitely scrambling um and 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 for too long i think the europeans have been as they say not all europeans but complacent the uk hasn't been complacent but it has another problem which is what i think you guys talked about before which is um unwillingness of people to join the military uh, there was a, there was an article in the daily telegraph i think just a few days ago or last week and it's talking about you know the inability to incentivize people uh you know in their early 20s to join um, and, and, you know, we've seen, uh, is it Denmark or whoever it was talking about reducing the role, uh, you know, women can now join the military uh, as well if they want. So there are these, uh, these initiatives that are being made and you can talk about whether or not that's an illustration of European, um, competence or whatever, but it, it definitely is not something we've seen the Danish do for a long time. That's for sure. Um, but I, I, I still, I don't know whether or not, as I say, that that ultimately means things are sort of on the brink. Um, I don't. I think I think we're pretty close to headless chicken time when you've got Macron saying that uh, that France should put in ground troops because this war is existential for them, and then the Latvian president is saying uh, Russia delenda est. I mean, now the the only reason not to take them too seriously is because uh, they, they don't have the military capability to actually um to enforce what they're saying they want to do i think they're trying to maybe they're trying to stake out a position to try and get the americans to do something uh it's hard to know i mean it could just be the fact that they're in this echo chamber where you know all they listen to are other uh, other politicians and journalists and members of the blob in the mainstream media and so the only point of view they get is this point? It, it, or, they have their own propaganda fed back to them constantly that, you know, Putin is the new Hitler and Russia's on the march. And if they win in Ukraine, they're going to conquer Europe. So it's possible that, you know, that since this, these are the only perspectives they listen to, that they, they, they there's this uh, phenomenon of incremental com commitment where they keep getting more and more amped up in, in their, um, in their claims and and concerns so, about so David, about if, if if everybody's the same as you seem to be insinuating why have you got far right members or supposedly far right like georgia maloney who is opposed to homosexuality still saying that putin is a threat versus left-wing members of the spanish government versus centrists like macron clearly there is not a just blob in europe Ge Ge georgia georgia maloney is a fake populist Politics. she's a globalist who Georgia Maloney is a fake. No, she's is, has been exposed as a fake started, populist. Started, what? You think she got into bed with uh, Slovenia and uh, um, the I think what you're and power, uh, uh, To be fair, she, she. Hold on, hold on, hold on. One at a time. Jo Jordan, a time. Jo Joe Biden was just kissing her on the forehead. Do you see that photo? Uh, yeah. She. I mean, uh, yeah. No. He's. She has been welcomed with open arms into the globalist club. She Doesn't, has completely people, gone back. People can agree on, on certain. You, you do realize that people can agree on some things, but not others, right? He, you are. He, you are here, here's here's what's happening in right, Europe, just, just broadly. 
about this issue, which is why I have a massive, massive gripe with some of what you say. Uh, the fact that NATO just wants to grow constantly. Maybe it's because countries actively voluntarily want to apply. Countries of can course they do. Why wouldn't you? Them. Why wouldn't you want the U.S. to protect you? You don't even have to spend any money on your own security. Just the U.S. protection. Uh, just, sort of personally, I think that's. Uh, I think that's what? a. Uh, slightly disingenuous argument because it doesn't matter why countries want to join there are greater security um, considerations to, to consider like it doesn't matter if they join by choice if they're compromising a neighboring great powers security interest by creating a security dilemma there's going to be a problem that's the problem with nato expansion it doesn't matter why it's expanding. I don't support NATO expansion, just to be clear. I think it is part of the reason Ukraine has happened. But I, I, it, I think it's disingenuous to say that countries are being forced to join when they can leave. No, I never said that. Uh, I don't I think anyone, that. Of course, of think course, course they, of course, they want to join. Why wouldn't you want the United States to pay for your defense? But then I mean, the U.S. is still the most powerful country in the that. world. Why wouldn't you want to become a security dependent of the United States? Of course, every country that can sign up for that is going to want to do it. Yeah, but then uh, don't use the words that they've been forced to join. I never said they've been forced. I think there you're making some kind of coercion, perhaps. But uh, I mean, and and okay, part of anyway, that by let's offering... get back to the topic. Uh, this is besides the point. Um, look, I, I I agree with some of what you're saying, David, but I don't agree with this um, interpretation that sort of because I mean, Marilyn Le Pen even came out. Marilyn bloody Le Pen, daughter of whatever his face, right? One of the most right wing people, and again, whether you like her or not, but she's a pretty specific person and even she's now saying that putin is a threat so unless she's been coerced into saying that i that's that's surprising. isn't that isn't that though the european narrative i mean what other options do they have if they start if they start saying that putin isn't a threat then the last two years all of the mistakes they've made all of the compounding you know fuck ups are going to be all for naught because putin is no longer a threat to europe like for, macron has no choice in what he says Macron is up against a wall where his, I mean, his government is, is starting to look really, really bad, right? The, 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 the French leadership is starting to look really bad. And if you don't have that boogeyman uh, in Russia, right, what, what, what are you going to blame everything on? The reason why France is losing in Africa is because of Russia. The reason why the French economy and the French farmers are protesting is because of Russia. You know, Russia, 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 focus on that. Don't focus on the problems we have here. That goes for all of Europe. Right. It doesn't matter if you're right, left or center. A boogeyman is a boogeyman. And if that is the narrative that every other European nation is following, you have to follow that or you're going to be a Victor Orban and you're going to be threatened by the European Union uh, with your funding, with everything. They're, they're basically talking about throwing Orban out of office in, in Hungary because he's going oh, against the, the EU oh. narrative. Um, Look, every, every everybody, everybody, every politician in Europe has to ritually denounce Putin, you know, yep. um, but the question is, what do they want to uh, have happen in this war? What What is the level of participation that they want? And the all the parties that are gaining steam in Europe right now are the, the populist parties, the ones who want this war to be over, who want to cut a deal, who recognize that this war has not been good for Europe, that it goes against the interests of their people. And the reason why uh, Macron and all these other leaders are increasingly unpopular is because they've been fanatically pursuing this war in Ukraine instead of issues that are actually important and salient to their own publics. Do you know how and, unpopular the average French president is, David? Do you know his average polling number? Just out of interest. It's no, like 19 percent, isn't it? Minus 20 usually. So it's not just because of the war. It's again, you're grossly simplifying stuff to see. But Macron your... is less popular now than he was before the war. Yeah. Not Macron, really. wasn't, Macron oh. wasn't very popular to begin with, to, 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 to be entirely okay, honest. Then. And okay, let's, is... let's, 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 let's not focus on France then. Let's talk about. But, but, but before okay, we pivot, what, about, what about the rise of IFD in yeah. Germany? Yeah. yeah. Be, be, before let's we shift from that point, and let's talk about. Something else. No, 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 no. Just, just no, replace, no, no, just replace Macron with any other. European leader. They're all they're all doing the exact same thing. They're all saying the maybe exact because thing. there is a genuine becoming... sentiment that Putin is a bad person. And no, but they're all becoming maybe. more unpopular through that okay, narrative yeah. choice. Okay, uh, but, but how much of this Piotr do you think is it's French opportunism trying to you know seize the mantle of uh, of of your of the European Union since and European NATO since they have that opportunity? Germany isn't it? Uh, for a talk about shifting the the, bal the balance of uh, the center of power to Poland. 
uh, haven't uh, haven't gone anywhere. It's a perfect opportunity for France to be France. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Especially with after the embarrassment, I agreed with what Africa. Scott and David said about Africa. Right, Macron is pissed that um, he no longer controls the CFA area or common French currency area of um, uh, of the Sahel. He's pissed. And he's also pissed off with the snubs that Putin did to him, I have to say, rather hilariously, at the beginning of the war in 22, right? When he when he sat at his long table in the, in Moscow or wherever it was, and uh, and Putin basically was like, yeah, 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 I, I understand, and then completely ignored him. Yeah, I absolutely, I'm acknowledging that. The bit where I have dis- differences is that you're assuming that, that it can't be a, fa- a factor of both. There can't be a common sentiment across lots of Europe that Putin is a problem for Europe. Uh, it's either he isn't or he is. And if he is, then it's some kind of broader narrative. Uh, and it's all part of some kind of, you know, collective effort to frame him as the boogeyman, when it could be he is a component that other countries see at varying degrees. The Baltics definitely think he's a bad thing versus the Spanish or the Portuguese, who might be a little bit indifferent because he's not as far, he's not as good. That's, that's, exa- that's exa- exactly it. It's, that's what I'm trying it's, to not, it's not a uniform, it's not a uniform position. The Baltics are screaming like headless chickens because that's what they do. They're terrified. But France, I don't think so. France, I think it's opportunism. I don't think the, I don't think the, uh, the Spanish care. Uh, they're they're at the or the Portuguese. They're like you have to go through in the entirety of Europe to get to them. They they're not they're not worried. Uh, the thing is, when I talk European policy, I generally ignore Eastern Europe because it's the power base and the decision base is in Western Europe. So I focus on them. Sorry, Baltics, you're still not important. Um. Yeah, and they've been. I mean, of all the places to be the most militant, but the Baltics is is a, is just a wild little that that whole bark, you know, barking Chihuahua sort of thing is is very interesting. That they are the most militant against Russia. When did they, you just refer to a region as a barking Chihuahua? <laughs> yeah, well, that's yeah, the, well, that's that's the true. Baltics, man. They don't. I mean, it's, I mean, no, it's funny. Let's be honest, yeah, yeah, looking to the Baltics funny. for Russian policy is like looking to Armenians. For Turkish policy, don't. It's not a good idea. It's not. It's not. A, it's not based on rationality. It's based on like centuries of hatred. Mm-hmm. Look, all, all countries are paranoid about their security, and if you're the Baltics and Russia is right there on your doorstep, you're going to be super paranoid about it. And there's a lot of history there that goes back a long time. Poland's the same way. I mean, there's a lot of huge amounts of hatred and Russophobia in these countries, given their histories. Uh, but that's why we should be careful about listening to them is because we're chain gang to them through this alliance and they want to, or they may see an opportunity to get the U S to fight their war for them or to use the U S to weaken Russia. I mean, that's what's in their interest. That's not what's in the United States' interest. Um, so we should just take everything they say with a huge grain of salt. In any event, to back to what Pyotr was saying before, I think the question is not whether Putin is popular in Europe or whether people think he's a good guy or bad guy or that kind of thing. What I think what's important is w- what is the European public's l- level of support for this war? And clearly it's declining over time because they're seeing that it has not been good for their economies, it's not been good for them, and they want their politicians increasingly to focus on problems in their own countries. And that's why support for the war is slipping and populist politicians all over the continent are seeing their support rise. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I, I, it's I, another, I, it's another, it's another backfire of this war that we set out to, um, we set out to basically uh, regime change Putin. And what's happened is we've actually destabilized all these European governments. Yeah. Do you think that I would add, I just add on that quick point. Sorry, Scott, really quickly okay, is, um, uh, no, I, 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 you know, again, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you on points that I do, and I'll, I'll push back on others. But I agree with you on the, on the any any reasonable person who thought that there would sort of be some kind of uh, regime change in Russia uh, is 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 out of their mind. Um, this guy, well, Biden is, thought that. That was literally said, this the man, whole This man cannot remain in power. Remember when he said that? Well, yes. Now his his administration his administration walk that back and said, well, that's not our official policy, but he blurted out the truth of what they were hoping to achieve. 
this man well, can all make power. That's their, that's ultimately their end goal. So yeah, then, so then every European leader is just, or every European and U.S. and the U.S. leadership is just what ridiculous, crazy, like as you just said, because they all thought that that is exactly what it's, was going to happen. Well, Scott, it's war of words, right? It's you are you make strong statements to try and signal to people on the other side. It's a diplomatic maneuver. If you come out being like, no, they really believed it. Remember, 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 uh, it. Remember Prigozhin's Prigozhin's uh, rebellion, and I mean, there, for a, a couple of days there on X, I mean, they were rejoicing in the streets, saying that this is it. Putin's going to get overthrown. We told you, and you know, I had like a million people in my um, feed telling me I was an idiot. Remember that? And then, of course, like two days later, they memory hold the whole thing. Well, yeah, but David, those people are extreme. Those are. No, those they're not. They're mainstream. Them. They're not extreme. They're mainstream. The whole foreign policy established in the blob was basically okay. in my feed saying I didn't know what I was talking about. That, you know, because I just posted I just posted a tweet saying that um, Ukraine was going to lose. I, actually, I was just summarizing a speech that Mearsheimer gave. And I had like thousands of people quote tweeting it saying this guy's an idiot. Look how poorly this aged. They really thought there was all this giddy talk that this was it for Putin. Well, yeah, some people did. Um, Not some I people, the whole blob. No, but what does that mean, man? What does that all mean? The, it was all the it means the policy, the policy elite. Down into, can you add some nuance to what you're saying? I, I think like the... Simplify, conflate and misdirect. Okay, I'd say, that's like all the, you're doing half the time. I'd say Brussels. The blob is the policy making establishment and elite in Washington. What? How else do you want me to was, define it? Was, it? I mean, of, of, of new and just lost her job, and this was her whole project. Of who? This, wait, wait, what's the blob represent to you? The the blob represents the the foreign policy establishment in Washington. Uh, who, it, who, it, who, who? Who of who? Okay. What does that, it's, what does that, it's, mean? What does that mean? mean? Um, it means it means the Biden administration, policy? people like Blinken and Newland. It means the think tanks where Newland is certainly going to land after what you know when she you know leaves. I guess Which she's going to Columbia. It means the foreign policy journals like Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, National Interest, and all the people who write for them. And if right. you read right. those publications, you'll see that there is a uh, a groupthink or a consensus around virtually every policy the United States pursues. The only debate, actually, is, is, I mean, okay, let me step back for a second here and explain this. So in other countries, you've got hawks and doves, okay? In the United States, in the policy elite, you've got hawks and lunatics. The only debate that ever happens is when there's a debate between the hawks and the lunatics. I would describe the lunatics as people who actually want World War Three. So when did we actually have a debate in Washington over the no-fly zone? Remember that? Or when Lindsey Graham got back from Kiev and said that we need to give an Article 5 guarantee to Ukraine if the Russians attack the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant? Remember that? Or now you're starting to get a debate over whether to send in ground troops or not? Again, these are the only debates we have within the policy establishment is between hawks and lunatics. There's a handful of people who are doves, like Rand Paul or you know Thomas Massey, people like that, but they're never covered by the mainstream media. So the there is absolutely a groupthink or consensus. There's an establishment. There's an elite, and there's an elite view, and that is what guides foreign policy decisions in the United States. Right. Okay. So as someone who's actually lived there for several years, I can tell you a couple of things. One, there's quite a few different think tanks that cover a broader way of the political spectrum. Um, if you're, well, what you're talking about seems to be the very fringes of either the far left or the far right, um, people who are purely anti-war or those who are absolutely let's go and bomb the shit out of everything. Um, and there's quite a lot of variancy between all these people, right? Um, not all these, what you're seeming to, my mind seem to do is say that all the universities, all the think tanks, anything that has a slightly aligned view on something um, is therefore part of this um uniform monolithic blob uh, and therefore they're all against our interests as americans and they can't be trusted which is not fair because i think that there are plenty of people who don't agree on one thing but maybe do on another um there's a, or a think tank called the kinsey institute of responsible statecraft yeah i know i'm a donor like to them i've written for their publication and they are not inside 
the the well, policy elite. Well, some people would argue they are because no, the they're not. That's like saying that. like John Mearsheimer is inside the policy elite. These are iconoclasts. These are dissidents. Their views are not taken they're seriously. They're not dissidents because they're still part of the mainstream. They're still interviewed on the mainstream. No, they're not. Media. They're not they part, part of the policy elite. When have you seen Mearsh John Mearsheimer? John Mearsheimer should be our national security advisor. Yeah. He can never get a job in any administration because he's said too many contrarian things. Uh, that's not true. Um, also, I would point out that the founder of Keynes Institute. This is an area I know a lot about. I'm sorry to tell well, you. Okay? Me too. I know I mean, a lot Mearsheimer about is the father of offensive realism. He's, he's not exactly a dissident. He's fallen out of favor recently, but no, he's, he's respected. Not a he's respected, but he is not part of the policy elite. He's yeah, again, I don't think that's for you to decide Listen, what represents these policymakers. These policy written for a publication doesn't mean you're an expert on every single aspect of it. I'm not, I never claim to be an expert on every aspect of it, but I, but I paid a lot finish. of attention the to the policy Institute, debate on this. Yeah, well, the the policy, the founder of the Kinsey Institute worked at Crisis Group, somewhere that I know quite well, and you would probably say is absolutely the quintessential example of, uh, you know, a blob body because it's been funded by, I don't know, someone like George Soros or something, right? So I don't think you can suddenly detach the Keynesian Institute because the person who works at Crisis Group has also I know a lot of people at Quincy, and I guarantee you that none of them would describe themselves as being members of the blob. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm undermining, I'm pointing out that your point has holes in it because someone who founded a group that you've written for was founded by someone who worked for another group, which is firmly in the blob. So it's not as far as, and you are therefore not as far away from it as you think. So yes, I am. Trying to none, of them, none of them would take my view seriously because I don't have the credentials that are required to be a member of the foreign policy establishment. No, but you're an incredible. And they make that point to me um, every single day. Individual, and therefore you must that's that's the point. They make that point to. on X every single day, usually when I bring up something incontrovertibly true, because the only way they can dispute it is to say I'm not an expert and I should be keeping my mouth shut. Oh, right, I don't think you should keep your mouth listen, shut. I just look, think you look, should also listen to people at other times because I you do you, you don't know your staff and you are obviously more involved in it than you like to let on. Uh, and this isn't me. I'm not trying to attack you. I'm just saying that I think you, you know, have got some good points. But I what what pisses me off is when you say very, very uh, absolutist statements, um, which, well, uh, maybe in principle, I agree with the nuances. I don't. Um, and I wish you would, you know, acknowledge that as well. Um, but, you know, anyway, uh, let's move on. Well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not even sure what we're debating. I mean, I, what I'm saying is, is that there is a foreign policy establishment in Washington. And there is a substantial amount of consensus and groupthink within that establishment. They all swim together as a school of fish. And they all calibrate themselves to make sure they're not outside the school of fish. Because if they're wrong... Everybody is wrong, and so it doesn't matter, and they're never accountable, they never get called out. That is basically the predominant characteristic. These people supported the Iraq war, they supported the forever wars of the Middle East, they supported getting into this Ukraine proxy war, and on and on and on. There, there is absolutely a, a an official position that you're supposed to take as a card-carrying member of the blob, and everybody understands that. And the people who fight it are the dissidents, they're the iconoclasts and the contrarians. And they would never be considered for any job in any administration. It's that simple. And I and I agree with you, David, because <clears throat> you you can see which of the you know the think tanks that we talked about earlier, the ones that are listened to, the ones that are promoted, the ones that are propagated, especially by uh, Washington, right? And that's ISW. That's the. Yes. It, it's all the same. It's all the same people, and they all say the same things, and then. You never hear contrarian voice. The whole reason I started doing this was because there was, like like David said, there's the hawks and then there's the lunatics, and there <laughs> there are no nobody's listened to who says anything besides support Ukraine, support Israel, uh, you know, and start arming Taiwan. Like that's the only that's the only like discussion being had, and the and the only discussion that's actually being had between those people is. Do we go to nuclear war or not? How do we prevent nuclear exactly. war? Yeah. Exactly. That's should, the should biggest casualty of the Cold War. It's that the neorealists were forced out of foreign policy circles and because you know their services weren't needed anymore or something, and the neoliberal institutionalists took their place. And a problem with neoliberalism is that it's a um, prescriptive framework where you do your analysis based on how you think the world should be, not how it is. And we end up in this mess because it's an ideology, not 
an analytical, an analytical framework. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, um, I mean, ever since unipolarity, the United States has been pursuing this crusading, very ideological foreign policy. They're trying to convert the whole world to democracy, and it's all based around regime change operations. And every single one of them has backfired massively, the Ukraine just being the latest. Yep, Scott, I think you're muted. Scott, muted. Thank you. I do agree. Um, I, I just mute because I'm doing stuff, so I'm sorry if I, uh, I'm, I'm not unmuted when I start talking. Um, I wanted to ask one more question pertaining to Europe. Do we think that some of this desperation, some of this, uh, you know, scraping the barrel, whatever you want to call it, Macron talking about sending tr tr troops into Ukraine, do we think some of that comes from the possibility of a mass migration issue out of Ukraine at the end of the conflict? Because uh, uh, to me, one of the things that you could make the argument of an existential crisis for Europe would be millions of Ukrainians leaving the country and heading into Europe and then Europe not being able to handle that influx of uh, immigration. Um, is it, do you do you think that this has something to do with it, or do you think it's just the narrative that we've we've talked about this entire time? I think I think it has a lot to do with it. I think Europe's general immigration problems um, are are part of that too. And already, the millions of Ukrainians that have entered Europe are at Germany offers entitlement programs and benefits up to like forty two thousand euros for uh, Ukrainian migrants, uh, and it's not that difficult to qualify. So these open borders, this like Shenzhen thing, it's going to become difficult with millions and millions more Ukrainians coming in, I think. there. Um, but I, I think like the cynic and myself would say that there's something more to it. Um, and I think uh, if, if Europe does have recruitment problems in the military now and they're bringing in a migrant class of people, well, that would just logically make sense that if you join the military, a fast track to EU citizenship, I mean, that could be a future for Europe. Anybody else? Yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, this is where we'll probably have more in, in agreement then. Um, I think that the, uh, well, I'll put it this way, right? in Europe most of the time, been to the front lines a few times, been to Poland much of last year. There's a, there's a growing frustration about um, the amount of, should we call them, uh, benefits or, uh, you know, um, concessions. Uh, there's a particular word I want to use, but there's a, you know, the freebies, I'll just use that, um, that some Ukrainians are getting amongst certain countries. Uh, I, was, I was talking to one friend in Vienna um, and she'd actually left Poland to come and work in Vienna because working in Poland as Polish, she was having a harder time getting certain access to, to, to uh, you know, funding or, or loans or, or whatever. And then the Ukrainians are coming in and are being given huge amounts of, um, you know, uh, ski, you know, it, it, there are loads of schemes, basically, that are helping them to sort of set up. And whilst I do think there are many Ukrainians that are productive members of society. Um, and are keen to, you know, settle in and do productive work. Um, there are those who are corrupt. There are those who are under, you know, exploiting the system. Um, and that's also happening here in the UK. Um, you know, I, 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 we've got a housing crisis here. You know, the average wage in the UK in London is like £32,000. The average house price here is now 450 So, you know, you, you can't get a mortgage for sort of, you know, years um, and even if you can, uh, you can't pay it off because you're not earning enough and wage and inflation is, is, is terrible. But Ukrainian, you come in here and you're given a, a pretty nice, you know, hotel room or I was told about one guy who was put up in um, the Savoy in London. Um, Savoy, I'm sure some of you know what that hotel is. Very, very prestigious. Um, so there is a problem here about, you know, uh, um, uh, sort of benefits sort of thing in terms of just generally like a mass migration thing. Um, Eastern Ukraine is not really inhabitable, hasn't been for a long time. So I think that a lot of Ukrainians have already moved westwards and sort of have, have settled. Most people would probably want to go back, um, but you would still probably see a good, what, three, four million. So 10 percent of Ukraine's population pre-war 
uh, staying in parts of Europe. Um, and so this is where we, we go back to that conversation about the risk to the European Union and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a, a concern about that. Um, other countries obviously not able to put up for the support of, of Ukrainians as others can. Germans, I know, whilst they welcome, you know, productive members, they've, they've had a crisis with, you know, since 2015 and the migration situation there. What, you know, 50, one and a half million migrants. Sweden, there's a massive problem. With um, with you know ra- rise in um, extremism, and uh, and 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 you know um, what you call like underclass communities, you know m- Middle East communities that are cropping up in parts of Stockholm, Gothenburg, and stuff, but they're not integrating; they're just existing, um, and that's creating huge amounts of crime, threat to women, um, and, and 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 theft, and and so on. So yeah, uh, I'm not saying Ukraine is going to do all that, but there is a general, I think, anti-immigration. Uh, sentiment that does exist amongst parts of Europe and, and could be a sticking point for some. Um, I just wanted to, David just sent this over. Um, so we, we, we can talk about this. Just, just uh, before we move on, Scott, just, yeah. um, so I hadn't heard your theory before about um, uh, a refugee crisis post-war motivating uh, European governments. I think it's an interesting theory. I do think it, highlights just what a mess Ukraine is going to be after this war reaches whatever conclusion it does. Something like 10 to 12 million Ukrainians have already fled to Europe. I mean, mostly women and children. So what I've read, I think Quincy actually had some data on this, that um, the number of people in Ukrainian controlled territory had decreased from something like 44 million to 28 million over the course of this war. So part of that's refugees part of that is losing territory to russia and then of the 28 million something like 12 million are pensioners so this whole country is demographically upside down even before the war the demographic pyramid was upside down and there were way too many old people the fertility rate had dropped way below replacement level so there weren't enough young people to sustain the population but now with so many people having left it's going to be even in worse shape and then you've got estimates around the cost of reconstruction being something like 500 billion. So who's going to want to pay for that? I don't think there's going to be substantial support in the U.S. for a half trillion dollar plus reconstruction package going to Ukraine. So this country is going to be completely devastated. It's going to have lost a substantial portion of its working population. It's going to have a huge number of pensioners to support. I don't understand how this country is going to work at all or function at all. So I think you bring up a point, like what happens then? And there probably will be a big exodus of refugees trying to make a better life in the rest of Europe. And and I and I guess it does just depend on how the situation winds up, right? If the, if the lines stay where they are right now, I don't I don't see a massive refugee crisis. But if the Russians start pushing east, the the situation collapses, the regime changes in Ukraine, something happens. I definitely believe that one of the biggest threats that Europe could be facing right now is on top of already having weak economies, having not enough money to invest in their defense because of all of their social programs and everything, uh, and you know having the U.S. do most of it anyway. With that refugee influx, refugee influx, that would be probably the straw that breaks at least some of the EU's back, right? Uh, Depending on where they go, obviously, um, you're going to have to create programs to help these people and deal with them. And it's just it, it seems like to me, that's where a lot of my fear would be coming from. Not so much that Russia is the existential crisis to France and Europe, but more that Ukraine is the existential crisis, because whatever happens in Ukraine could very negatively affect the overall situation in the EU. That's that was one of my uh, thoughts. Yeah. And, and I mean, imagine if this economic instability uh, it has in the past will lead to the rise of the far left and the far right in Europe. And uh, now in Germany, they're trying to sort of ban the AFD. Uh, which is, it's, it's, it's getting messy. So I mean, which is always is, a great way to down. get people to not like something is have the government ban it for sure. Right. Definitely <laughs> nothing, uh, nothing counterproductive about banning opposition. Um, so we do have this article uh, from the Washington Post talking about uh, in, in, a, in a particular Ukrainian village, there are almost no men left. Um, uh, David, did you want to talk about this some? 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, this is one of those mainstream media articles that finally spills the beans on something we've been talking about for a long time in independent channels, on Substack, on X, uh, that, I mean, several points. One is the reality of huge Ukrainian casualties. Uh, I mean, obviously, this 31,000 number that Zelensky recently put out there is laughable. And this this article, I mean, they're talking about one village, but they quote a man who talks about in his unit, they had 12 people and only two are left. So, you know, at least anecdotally, the the losses are staggering. They talk about the fact that they're out of volunteers. I mean, the people who wanted to fight in this war volunteered in the first you know, six months of the war. And since then, nobody else wants to serve. And so it talks about how men are hiding in their houses. They ref- they don't want to go to the store. They're being dragged off the streets. We've seen a lot of these videos of these press gangs going around and rounding up men at gunpoint and throwing them into the back of cars. And again, you know, whenever an independent channel has talked about this, they're accused of being, you know, Votnik propaganda. And, um, and here we have you know, the Washington Post basically confirming that all those stories are true. Um, so suddenly, you know, the, the Washington Post has fallen prey to uh, to Russian propaganda. Um, so in any event, it's, it's I, I, I view this as one of those reset articles. It's not telling those of us who've really been paying attention anything new, but it's kind of a message from, you know, one of the, the most elite, mainstream media publications to the rest of the media that, okay, we have to reset the narrative a little bit. You know, we can't keep, you know, we we can't keep pretending like the Ukrainians aren't suffering uh, huge losses and that, uh, and that there's still a lot of people who, who actually want to fight this war in Ukraine. Uh, What's motivating them to do this? I don't know exactly. Um, I mean, that's a good question. Something that is particularly interesting in this article is they talk about the, school children that are being basically prepared to be soldiers. You know, they, mm. they, they have these schools around Ukraine. Uh, it's protecting Ukraine students in the classroom. Right. And, and obviously they're in military uniforms doing the JROTC thing, uh, which is um, a worrying sign because when you're running out of manpower and you start getting kids ready to fight, that's, that's a, uh, historically bad, 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 bad sign for the future of your country. Um, and talking yeah. about the demographics, the, what you were talking about earlier, David, the the mention of the p- potential mobilization of 27 to 18 year old males um, is a very, very, very worrying thing because that demographic is already bare. It's already bare in Ukraine. It was like David said, the upside down triangle where you have mostly elderly who are, um, in terms of like the social welfare system are very uh, uh, intensive on that. Uh, and then you have the bulk of your economy, the working class, the, uh, you know, 20 to 40 year olds. Um, but in particular, the future of any given country is the 18 to 27 year old men. That is the, the, the last group that you want to touch in terms of mobilization uh, because you don't want to lose the future of your country. And Ukraine talking about potentially doing that and the inability for them to actually begin mobilizing them. They should have done it a long time ago if they were going to do it, uh, I think really points to the dire, dire situation uh, in the AFU and in Ukraine. So I I fully understand why uh, European leaders are starting to uh, sweat over the situation in the country and potentially the ramifications of a major Ukrainian loss uh, to the Russians. Um, mo- and if anybody has any last things to say about Ukraine, we can talk about that. And then I had one more topic off of Ukraine that I well, wanted to um, talk about. Yeah, I just, because I uh, stuffed an article in the uh, in the chat about, about the demographics and the problems of mobilization. Like, Ukraine has one, uh, 11.1 million uh, men aged between 25 and 60, which is what they're mobilizing. 1.2 million are already serving. 2.9 are living in the occupied territories. 1.3 are are abroad in Europe. Zero point six million are critical workers, and one and a half are disabled. That only leaves like uh, three point seven million people that they could uh, that, that they could potentially mobilize. It's not a and the laws they're talking about in that article of just 
uh, they're at the point where there's a um, war commitment tax that they're, they're, that they're proposing. It's you pay the 500 uh, USD equivalent a month on top of your taxes and you're contributing to war, you don't get mobilized. If you can't pay that, and most of Ukraine can't, you're going. You're you're going. You're being sent to the trenches. That's yep. where we're at. Pay to live. Yeah, well, I was, yeah. was going to add that on the um, on the recruitment mobilization side. You know, this has never been a numbers game that was going to be in Ukraine's favor. It's always been that if you were going to talk about full scale war or, or you know not just a quick in and out sort of thing then yeah naturally the, the the ukrainians are going to be up against it which is why this continuous supply of western ammunition and and technology you know the ukrainians can't just win through uh, sheer manpower they have to do so through advanced tech um and because there's been inconsistencies in supplying that from us or germany or, or wherever it is that that undermines it and and, and once the russians We've seen this historically in the First World War and other things. Once they once they get their their shift into gear, um, or whatever, then they do start to get into the momentum. And Russia is now spending what 170 billion dollars, three times more or less its um, usual uh, war budget or, or military expenditure per year. Um, and you know a lot of major um, uh, industries. Or, or, or energy of focus is being redirected towards military matters. Um, and I think one of the things that Western countries, again, rather, very misguidedly think is that because then there becomes domestic issues such as with, you know, inconsistent energy or, um, you know, lack of food, certain types of food or, or whatever it is, that that will cause a domestic upheaval and Putin will be pressured. And then, you know, it, it's a very long winded ripple effect, which is not really based on anything really realistic um so so in that regard yeah you know putin is very good at at well the military is very good at strategical patience um and just waiting stuff out and using you know time and seasons and stuff like that to your advantage right think you know general winter with napoleon so um yeah i i don't think it's going to really benefit ukraine longer term i i did also just want to add one quick point about the sort of post-war because i worked on a report on this very thing and the budget ranges from as slow as 120 billion to the ukrainian estimation obviously putting at the high end of over one trillion by contrast or in context uh, the marshall plan in 1948 cost in today's money about 117 billion so you're talking the lowest end still higher than the most it was built to reconstruct the whole of europe after the second world war so you know this is not something that's going to happen i think it would be more sort of the europeans focus on trying to i don't know militarize eastern ukraine wherever the line of contact is cut um and and and, and you know securitizing that area and, and ultimately sort of helping ukraine invest in uh industries or parts of the country which will not be at, well in theory um you know a threat that's that's a a, a scenario i can imagine but again it's based on a lot of uh, speculation and, and i think that um zag and david's points about you know uh, sentiments amongst europeans for funding all that sort of stuff is uh, is going to be a definitely a factor so yeah you know i didn't i didn't know that marshall plan number that's interesting that um the reconstruction numbers out of Ukraine are so much greater than the Marshall Plan. I think that's just indicative of how much looting there is going on. Um, there was but in any event, forty million that? that was looted, wasn't there? I think. What's that? There was uh, one of the senior military officials looted about forty million dollars worth of equipment. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, so the, the official number I've seen, and I think it came from like the World Bank or some organization like that, was the five hundred billion number. So if you're saying that's five times greater than the Marshall Plan which was for all of Europe, and this is just for one country. Again, it just tells you how inefficient and corrupt every all of this is. But I, I just want to go back to the Washington Post article for a second. Um, the, the point I want to make about the Washington Post article is that I think articles like this are really important because they refute the entire narrative of this war. And specifically, the narrative is, is that Ukrainians are fighting for their freedom. Right. They are voluntarily fighting for their freedom. And so therefore, we must support them. How can the U.S. turn their back on these people who are bravely fighting for their freedom? Well, in fact, what's happening is that Ukrainians don't want to fight. They're being rounded up at gunpoint. 
and fed into this meat grinder. There, there is no Ukrainian population left that's willing to fight. And so why, why are they being rounded up? Well, because the United States wants to weaken Russia or Joe Biden doesn't want to lose this election, doesn't want Ukraine to collapse. Um, you know, Zelensky doesn't want to lose power. Uh, those are the reasons why this war is continuing. What's really happening on the ground in Ukraine is that an American puppet, an American client regime, is rounding up an involuntary population at gunpoint to feed them into this meat grinder of almost certain death. That's what's happening. And um, and so I think articles like this, when you know, when they finally uh, provide the truth, um, I mean, they, I, I don't know if it's going to have that big an effect. But if you're paying attention, you realize that it refutes everything the politicians are saying about this war right now. Yeah, no, it, it, these, these articles do th exactly what you say, you know, they, they are, and it's interesting too, because as soon as these articles come out and they are these contradictory articles that, you know, go against the narrative, uh, for whatever reason they're published, whether it's just actual journalism or there's some narrative being pushed on the backside of it, uh, even the, the people who are most prolific in the pro-Ukrainian information space, the people who are pushing this war the most, will instantly denounce these as uh, Russian propaganda. So, you know, unfortunately, I agree with you, David. I think for the layman, this, this is very good to come out. And hopefully the, the U.S. population actually sees some of these articles, um, even though I doubt it. Uh, but the core, the base of the support for Ukraine, the the vote, the very vocal group, it's just they they don't they don't buy any of this ever. So that's always it's always difficult in that uh, sense. It was, um, no, it, I, I, it's it's a bit strong to just say that all Ukrainians are being forced to fight. There are plenty of Ukrainians who want to fight. It, I don't think I don't think you meant all. I think I meant everybody who is wanting to fight is currently in a trench or dead. Everybody who is now being picked up and mobilized are not, they're not volunteering. They're, that's why they're having such t terrible recruitment numbers. That's why you're seeing people getting pushed into vans. I mean, that's been happening the entire war, but now it seems to be almost specifically how they are getting men for these conflicts. I mean, we, we saw what, 34 uh, Ukrainian men in one van, each paid 10,000 euros to uh, mm -hmm. get out of the country. Uh, so $340,000 in, in a single van heading out of the country and all those guys were pulled out, pulled on the ground, arrested, and they will all be mobilized and sent to the front. That's, that's the bulk of the yeah. Ukrainian army now. And it's only going to deteriorate and become a lower quality armor our army the longer it goes. Yeah. And let's also keep in mind that the people who haven't mobilized, especially in the beginning, uh, their morale, the, the, these are the ones who like volunteered, right? But their morale is non-existent is non-existing. They've been in, they haven't been rotated out in two years. That's another problem with the mobilization uh, numbers is it's everybody hears, oh, they're running out of manpower and thinks because they're all dead. No, no, it's because you have to rotate people out. Fighting power and fighting efficiency decreases significantly, exponentially, even the longer they're in the front line. These people need a break. And if they don't get it, well, they need to, you need to mobilize for them to get it. And if they don't get it, they're just you might as well be packing corpses into the into the trenches. Yeah, that's a it's, it's just a meat defense. At, the, at that point yeah uh, and look at look at the regions they're mobilizing from too uh, yes. yeah well uh a lot of the regions where the people um uh, are russian speakers uh, or not considered or, ukrainian or not considered ukrainian maybe they're they have some ethnic russian maybe they're considered um more along the lines of uh eastern russian slav than uh western catholic uh ukrainian slav and those are the ones that are usually getting mobilized and pushing back saying, I'm not going. So it's, that's kind of interesting. And I, I think that's one thing that's kind of like underplayed uh, sort of flies under the radar here and lots of genocide accusations. But if you do look at the maps that show, um, you know, the concentrations of who's getting mobilized, they're almost always from the East. I, I, I wanted to move away from Ukraine. Good. It was a good point, Zach. Um, I wanted to move away from Ukraine for the last little bit of this uh, roundtable, and I wanted to discuss something that David has talked a lot about, um, which is the TikTok ban. Um, this is something that is, uh, I think, 
very important uh, in the United States currently. Um, it has a lot of implications. And uh, I just wanted to hear some of your opinions on it because I definitely have my opinions on what I think this is about and what 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 means to the what end this serves. Um, but David, I would like to hear your opinion. Yeah, I guess I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is that I'm not um, I'm not theoretically opposed to the idea of a TikTok ban if first it can be shown that this truly is a national security threat, and second that the remedy is narrowly tailored to address that. Neither of those things are true or have been shown. So first of all, there is no hard evidence. There's no hard proof that's been provided that uh, TikTok is a national security threat. It's never really been explained how. I haven't, I've yet to understand what is the data exactly that's being collected that is such a security threat to the United States. I mean, are we talking about, um, you know, what videos I like? Um, doesn't seem that important. Um, it's never been explained what data is really that unique because there's lots of sites that you can go to get this kind of data. And in fact, you can go on the open market and they sell bundles of this data. And I think all of these different governments are buying up this data. So again, I'm not, it's not, it never really been explained what the data is that's both unique and damaging. And then also what's the proof that's actually being shared with the CCP. I mean, I'm willing to believe that it's being shared with the CCP, but I'd like to just see some proof. So none of that's ever been provided. And so I just have to, and I, and I think before you destroy a company like that, I think there should be some proof. I mean, ideally there'd be a judicial proceeding, not just some sort of like public debate where this is railroaded through. Then you get into the, the question of, is this bill narrowly tailored to address this, this harm? And there, I think it's important to understand that this bill doesn't just apply to TikTok. It creates a whole new category of applications called foreign adversary controlled applications, or what I've you know called FACA for short. Um, and a FACA is defined as it can it, it can it's first of all it's not just an app. It can be any website uh, or desktop app or even a VR app. So basically, any kind of software application that's in the content or social content sharing or social space. So this potentially applies to every American uh, content sharing or social website or app. Okay. Uh, provided it falls into one of uh, three categories that defines control by a foreign adversary. So one is that if the company is, is based in or incorporated in uh, a foreign adversary country, and there's four of them. It's, it's uh, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. If it's incorporated in one of those countries, it's a FACA. Or if it has a 20% ownership group from one of those countries, it's a FACA. So imagine if you know ByteDance was a 20% owner of X, or Chinese VCs were a 20% owner collectively of X, then X would be a foreign adversary controlled application. And then the final, the third category, which is the one that's most concerning to me, is that if that website or application is uh, subject to the direction of or control of, um, of people from a foreign adversary country, then that can be uh, a foreign adversary controlled application. So now... What proponents of the bill would tell you is, well, there's already, you know, a lot of case law around what subject to direction or control means. But what I've seen recently in case after case is that prosecutors and the attorney generals of the Justice Department are getting more and more creative around this type of language to go pursue and prosecute political enemies like Jack Smith subverting hundreds of years of case law around the uh, definition of fraud to go after Trump on this uh, bank shot fraud case where he supposedly he defrauded the American people on January 6th. So in any event, you know, my bottom line on this is that I think that this bill creates a substantial risk that a large number of applications, both foreign and domestic, could get lumped in and allow uh, a creative attorney general and a vindictive president to go pursue their political enemies. And I have to be worried about you know, not just TikTok, but sites, platforms like X and Rumble or True Social. I think they could all be essentially rounded up and over time find themselves targeted by this bill. 
I think you're mute, Scott. I have my personal beliefs on it. I, I, it just seems like too perfect of an opportunity for so, to solve so many issues. You have, if you, if you want, you know, a foreign controlled app, whether, I mean, if you actually look at the ownership, it's not really that foreign controlled, but, um, and the data is, is stored in the, in Texas. But besides that, um, I could understand the U S government wanting to deal with a potential Chinese propaganda tool, um, because, uh, you know, TikTok does present, uh, ideas that are not necessarily really agreed upon in the United States, particularly on Israel and Palestine right now. I know that there is a big outcry by the Israeli Israeli lobby to get, uh, TikTok banned because of the information that they show, um, which is concerning to, to me to say the least. I don't think, I mean, even if you support Israel, I don't think that you should want, uh, information silenced. Um, I also think it has to do with the fact that TikTok is eating other big tech companies lunch. Um, Facebook, uh, you know, that that whole group, um, they want their apps used and TikTok is a much, much, much more popular app right now. Um, so there, there's that aspect of it. Um, and then overall, I just think that this is another step in government censorship. It's just the easiest way that the government can come in and say, <clears throat> you know, I, I mean, my page, for instance, if they don't like the information I'm producing, they can claim that I'm some foreign entity and they can kick me off, even though I live in the United States. I don't get money from any country outside of the United States. Uh, I mean, besides like your guys's donations, but no government gives me money. So, I mean, I, I just see this as, again, another freedom being lost uh, potentially in, in disguising it as um, some nationalistic protection of, you know, uh, data. I think yeah, it's and, a bit more insidious than that. Uh, but let me um, start from zero, I guess. Uh, the, the rhetoric used to um, to paint TikTok as what it is, is it's basic app functionality that if you read as, you know, a, a, in technical terms and you're a tech literate boomer, it sounds really frightening. Access to files, access to location data. It access the internet through your home network. Spoiler, that's how every single mobile app functions. Every mobile app has those uh, has those permissions. Otherwise, they cannot function. Uh, so the other thing is, uh, well, as Scott pointed out, the data is stored in not only in the United States, in Texas, but by an, held by an American company, Oracle. Uh, I mean, Oracle is huge in government, in, in, in government and military installations. So if, you have a, if the problem is Oracle is insecure, then... Uh, you know, have a talk with your government military. Uh, but the thing is, the data is, you could infer a lot from location data and like where people are, what they're doing, who else is there, when are they there, but every social media site has this data. Facebook has it, X has it, that's what little location uh, settings in your, in your privacy settings are for. And... Um, my theory is it's they don't have a problem with the data being collected. They have a problem with them not having access to that data. A Singaporean company does not need to uh, to obey the United States government when the United States government requests that the data be handed over. They're not an American company. An American company does. So that's what they mean by selling it to a more friendly or more favorable company. Uh, the other thing is to under uh, you got to understand what TikTok is. It's not just TikTok. It's not just the United States. TikTok is the uh, global version of Douyin, which is Chinese TikTok. It's the original uh, product. So it's not they're not just be, uh, saying either sell us the uh, the app or 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 get banned. It's sell us the uh, the app for the entire world outside of China, so we could collect all of that data as well. That's why it's so much more. Uh, so so much so much more insidious, I think. But wait, so are you are you saying that you're you're saying that TikTok is more insidious than it might otherwise appear? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying the bill is more insidious because this. I don't think this is about. Uh, I think uh, national security is is being used as a premise. I don't think it's. I'm not sold that it's a national secu a security issue. Um, mainly because look, I use foreign social services because I'd rather because I'd rather a foreign government have that data than my own government, because a foreign government is much more limited in what it can do with that data. Uh, 
but no, it's uh, it's because it's not just TikTok in the United States. It's global. It's you're getting uh, you're, you, that that data isn't is, isn't a, isn't just collected on on American users. It's collected for all users the world over. And this is data that you can't uh, that the U.S. government can't otherwise access because unlike Facebook, which is an American company, if they want that data, they have to make a request for it, and Facebook has to comply. TikTok doesn't. That's a point of contention here. That's what's that's that's, that's what that's yeah. What the I, I, if I might just jump in, um, I, I I'm 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 largely in agreement in 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 this that I, I I've never been a fan of TikTok completely. Um, I do think that there are some questionable aspects to it. Um, I mean. You know, in, in, in intelligence, you know, you can either get people who collect data and intel and bring it back to you, or you can have influence agents that go out and admit your own set of interests and stuff. Uh, we had a case here in the UK back in September where a chap was trying to um, influence um, a senior member of the government, like in a commission or something like that, parliament, uh, not government, and he was, you know, he was uh, he was being paid by the CCP, um, so there are people who can do that, and, and and TikTok is one of these things I think a lot of Western governments believe is being used as a vehicle to try to push a certain narrative by the Chinese Communist Party or something. Um, that being said, uh, this bill I agree with Vaughn does have some quite insidious undertones, uh, mainly because. You know, if you talk about data capture or, or just, you know, in, knowing about, you know, you as a person in public, well, what any difference is um, uh, is Facebook or Meta and, and uh, any of the large multinational corporation tech companies doing that's different to TikTok, right? There are certain steps they all have to do. And so one paper I said, you know, was reading argues that, you know, if you're going to um, ban TikTok on the basis of certain, you know, X, Y, and Z. If that's the details, then you've got to look at it from Western companies as well. But they're not going to do that because, well, they're American companies. So, um, you know, and also hold the whole thing about trying to acquire TikTok for, you know, US control or whatever ownership. So, yeah, I, I definitely think that TikTok is a, I, I don't like it in, uh, in in many ways, but I also think that there are some ulterior motives for this bill as well which we can't well we'd be we'd be daft to uh to ignore so i don't know if that uh anyone disagrees with that but... i mean, I, mean Scott, I don't to your I point don't, i don't even use tiktok but like i you gotta call the bill what it is, right? i would agree there's more insidious motives i don't know too much about this but they've been uh hemming and hawing about it for a while and i I would assume, given the climate and nature of things, that this is just, as Piotr said, some sort of way to assert more control over the media and social media. Um, I just, I mean, I assume that's their aim. And even if it's not their aim, it could be the result, right? Because these things are a slippery slope and you get precedents built on top of precedents. And, you know, once you open the door, it always gets easier and easier to, to, um, you know, to add more regulation or to, um, you know, target incremental sites. So it, you know, the motivations of the people involved may be, or a lot of the people involved may just be, they want to get TikTok. But once they open the door, again, it all comes down to whether uh, a, uh, a future attorney general wants to get creative with their interpretation of the law. And Scott, to your point, I mean, you absolutely could be targeted. If you have a website, uh, if somebody, if the Justice Department can make a case that you are um, subject to the direction of a foreign adversary, whatever the hell that means, then they can open an investigation of you. And that may be enough to bankrupt you. I mean, they start doing discovery on you. They start demanding a bunch of documents. Um, are you really going to persist if, you know, the Justice Department of the United States is like decide to target you as somehow working for a foreign adversary? And it's not like these types of accusations aren't made every day. I mean, like virtually every single day on X, we see that if you um, if you merely take a contrarian view on this war, you're accused of working for the Kremlin. 
Donald Trump. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, I consider myself just to be completely neutral. I don't, you know, I just want the United States to be out of this war. And from the beginning, I was accused of being some sort of Putin agent. Yep. And they accuse me every day of having investors from Russia. And that's why I take the positions I do, which I don't, by the way. You know, I invest in American companies. I don't have any, I don't have any foreign, uh, I don't certainly don't have any Russian investors. Um, in any event, the point is just these accusations are made every day. I mean, virtually every day, Donald Trump is accused of being an, a Putin uh, stooge or agent or puppet or something like that. So our political discourse is full of this type of McCarthyism where accusations are made without evidence that if somebody holds a certain point of view, they must be working for one of these foreign enemies. That is exactly what this bill says it would stop or give the power to the executive branch to pursue, which is shutting down censoring websites and applications that are subject to the direction of a foreign adversary. And so that, this, yeah, and that, and that extends to, I mean, that it, it, it's not just working for a foreign adversary. It's what they deem to be a foreign adversary at any given time. Like you could be talking about uh, China today and it's okay, but then tomorrow when China is not, you know, no longer okay to talk about you, your whole thing gets removed. Like do, if this bill goes through, does Tucker Carlson's page get taken down when he goes and does an interview with Putin because they don't want you to hear that conversation? Is that something that ends up happening? Like it's, it's just a slippery slope of, you know, you, your freedoms. If you're an American, you, you should really care about this because these are your freedoms that are just slowly being taken away right underneath your nose without uh, your consent and without um, you really knowing what's happening because it's disguised as something else. Personally, that's my belief. Um, that brings us to two hours. I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you so much, David. Thank you so much, Zag. Thank you so much, Piotr. And thank you so much, Clown. I really appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, as I say, uh, this is now an open invitation. Anytime that there's a round table, you are more than welcome to come and join. Uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you, everybody who listened. We had a total of 7,000 viewers today. That is pretty cool. I appreciate that. Um, thank you for everybody who commented with super chats and super thanks. Uh, and be sure to turn in, not, ne not next week, but the week after that for the next uh, Calibrated Roundtable. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you so much. If anybody has anything to say, go ahead and say it now. Always a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank I you. mean, that was look, fun. Um, no, I mean, look, I know we've had some back and forth, and I, I think it's good. Um, it's all, you know, I, I think it's good to, I agree with you on most things, not on everything. And I think it will be good to revisit these things over time. And, you know, um, that's how we grow and learn as people, isn't it? By having these kinds of debates and stuff. So okay. cheers to you, Scott, for hosting and everyone, if you haven't already, you know, support scott he's doing a lot of good stuff i appreciate yeah. it and and support everybody who comes on these uh round tables go follow david go follow clown go fo follow piotr and thank you piotr for coming on i know you're kind of in the hot seat you're being the disagreement of most of this uh round table but i really do appreciate you coming on because without that dissenting uh point of view uh to you know the rest the normal uh in this round table it uh it makes the conversation much more lively. Um, totally. I agree with that. So thank you. I'm not you, sure to be contrarian. I just, yeah. No, 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 no. no. It's, your, it's your perspective and your opinion. And it's great to have, all, if, if you're forcing us to think about our own positions, that's the, I mean, that's the best thing ever, right? Like the only way you improve yourself personally is by being tested, by being questioned, by people with outside perspectives. If not, you're just in an echo chamber and nothing ever gets fixed and solved. So I really do appreciate you all coming on. Zag, did you have anything to say? You got Oh, no, I, I was going to just second that, Scott. It, it's nice to have Piotr in here because it keeps us honest. Uh, there's no propaganda or is less propaganda, no conspiracy theory. You know, we're not trying to slip anything by the goalie here. It's just all above board, just like a nice opinion-based conversation. Exactly. Um, and, and we appreciate it. And, and thank you for having me, Scott. This has been a lot of fun. Yes. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for everybody who watched. Have a great day and I will see you on the next one. Goodbye.